Yes, Mr. Gibson. May I thank the court for sitting early? Well, it's my lady you should thank in particular. Thank you, my lady. I accept your thanks on her behalf. Um, my lords, my lady, I passed on a few questions yesterday, uh, and I thought I might start with, with those. Um, first of all, uh, just by way of housekeeping, uh, we're seeking to agree a list of... Um, references to areas which have been of interest to the court. I think you've been sent a list which has not yet had our input or our full input. So if it was, I, I assume the court would prefer to have an agreed list. Uh, or, uh, and if, the, if that is right, then we would aim to get that to you uh, when the hearing finishes, because it seems to be growing on a rolling basis. But I'm in the court's hands. Yes, uh, we've um, uh, not been, we haven't discussed it it looked the bit that I looked at but I didn't follow up the references looked broadly the sort of thing that we wanted um, and uh, I don't think there's any real advantage but my lord and my lady will speak up if they feel differently in our having anything unagreed anything further unagreed before the end of tomorrow but we will be trying to start work really very promptly and before Easter. Yes. So if we can have an agreed note on Monday morning, yes. Um, or if unagreed, the usual procedure followed, um, uh, uh, I think that would be uh, a, a real value. Yes, of course. We'll, we'll that. <coughs> um, moving then to some... Uh, points which fell from the court, which I, I think it's probably convenient to deal with at the outset. Um, the first point is uh, my lady, Lady Justice Carr, um, asked for further assistance in relation to the word resolved in, in Michael 5, uh, paragraph 83. Um, as, as you know, that's a reference to the answers provided by the claimants. The actual word used is concluded, and the reference for that in the precise answer is P80-3867-2, at 3868. It's a trial bundle. Oh, no, in your, no, it's yeah. your new bundle, yes. P. Yeah. Do you have a P bundle? Yes. We do. Oh. Well, you might want to just, just look at it. It's at 3868. Isn't it very small? This is the appendix to Michael 5, and this is question 45. Not in mine. Mine doesn't. It's not yet in my tab. I have it there, but not mine. Is this bundle? Ah, oh, well, I've been discriminated in favour. I've got it. Bundle P. Bundle P, tab 80. Yep. Uh, 3866. Oh, I got 3868, that would be said. Well, 3868 is, is the second page. It starts at page 3868, which is in fact the interpreter's um, oh, I do certificate. It's a letter. I do have it. It's a letter of 3868. Yes. Not been put in. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I think it. Is it. Um, 3871. No. Well, tell us first which. Tell us first which page of the letter we're referring to. We're, we're, if it's, it's the same the thing, it has also it has left over no. from a previous bundle. It says C three. It's not two. the letter. It's a questionnaire we're looking for. Yes, that's what I thought. I was a bit puzzled. But, um, well, I do anyway, apologise. It's, it's an answer in the questionnaire. I have a, a, a wrong reference. <clears throat> Um, but what you're getting, I, 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 I will be frank and say that I had not attempted to track down the questionnaire beyond existing. Is it in fact 
It's so the trust now isn't in our original trial bundle. No, it's not in no, original our original trial hearing bundle. Uh, yeah. But while you're in that, a further problem. If we, uh, I'm not sure in the end how much we'll turn on it, but um, of course it will have been important to anyway. So it depend on on the on the uh, depend on what on the how how the translator chooses to translate the Portuguese. But the question I was presumably, or maybe it wasn't. This is, this is the claimant's translation. It's the words used by the claimant's uh, solicitors. But were they not asked the questionnaire well, of Portuguese, Portuguese lawyers? Yes, they were. They were. Yes. But maybe they spoke English. I mean, let's not. This yes. is really is a small point. It's a small point. Yeah. Can I just check whether the next reference is right, please? 3872 We can pass that. Can you stay in the P bundle for my Lady Justice Carl's second question? <laughs> and let's hope this is more successful. I'm so sorry. It would have been particularly difficult yesterday. Yeah, right. These are bigger. <laughs> yeah. That's the right reference, but the writing is rather small. So may I just give you... Sorry, what's the right reference? The, 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 it, I'm so sorry. It's the right reference for question and answer 15, which relates to the 30% this is what the 30% is based on. Oh, I, sorry. What document are you referring to? I, I'm, I'm referring to the document at P stroke 81 stroke 3872. Yes, I see. Which is Q&A 15. And the yep. problem is it's very small writing, I see. It is. Uh, so I, I've asked uh, if it could, you could be given a bigger copy. And I've got a bigger copy for the court if it could be well, handed very out. Nice of you. It is actually legible, but I agree, yeah. not easily legible. Yeah. And Lady Justice Carr was asking for the source of the 30%. And here is a bigger copy. And I. And there's some evidence from Mr Goodhead on this. And then I'll, I'll come to that, yeah. yes. Thank so the question is, how will you cl your client receive some compensation if your case succeeds? SPG will bear the costs and so on. If successful, you will receive 70% of the amounts and the rest will be used and so on. Three year limitation period under Brazilian law. I'll, I'll be coming back to that one. Mm -hmm. um, So that's what their clients have been have been told so far as we know, and it hasn't been doubted that that is what they've been told. Um, and then, as my lady, Lady Justice Carr rightly says, of course, Goodhead Seven, paragraph ninety-two, puts a little bit more information on the point and says that in fact the maximum. That's the maximum is the way it's put. The maximum reduction. And somewhere he says... And then he says... In, yeah. Sorry. And, and then he goes on to say, large businesses or municipalities likely to be substantially less. So I, I think, my lady, that answers your, your point. Thank you. And Goodhead, Goodhead 7 is where? Goodhead 7 is at... Uh, O fifty seven three two three one. Yes. So I hope I fairly summarised that, um, and that's. Uh, what, what I, the judge was referring to in his judgment when he referred to the, 70, the 30%. Um, my Lord, Lord Justice Underhill, the Vice President, asked where you would find the, what we call the construction argument, the argument that Renova and Samarco are liable as a matter of law um, for dam related damages. And I, I took you to that, our, our arguments and the references in support of that are in the Turner skeleton at 3673 yes, when I took you to that yesterday. Um, 
Lady Justice Carr asked to provide the us to provide the underlying evidence in relation to the 27,000 statistic, which has been described as nuanced. That's the letter. I'll be coming to that later, but if you, you, I think you have the reference, but I can give it to you. It's P stroke 80, page 3866. And I'll be coming back to that, and that's the 82,000 fruiting into 27,000 and so on. Um, my Lord, Lord Justice Popperwell, asked me to check whether what I'd said about direct and indirect damages was correct and where the, the reference was. And that issue is addressed in DDA 2, paragraph 184, which is at L stroke 37, page 2405. Uh, I think I gave a reasonably accurate steer on that. Um, my Lord, you, you also asked to provide the reference where this, uh, Professor Didier deals with collective liquidation proceedings. And um, that is dealt with in Didier 1 at paragraph 230, which is H stroke 27 stroke 1342, and Didier 2 at paragraph 311 at L stroke 37 stroke 2445. You may be interested also to take note of what he says at paragraph 231 of um, his first report, where he talks about judicial cooperation and the extent to which, pursuant to the Brazilian rules of court, state courts and indeed other courts will cooperate in order to ensure the just and efficient uh, disposal of business. Now, the advantage of Didier too, my lady, is that uh, you see there, my lord, the references to R Rosa and where he disagrees or takes issue. But we will obviously include these references for the avoidance of any doubt in the document we seek to agree. But that's the, the short answer to your question, my lord. Um, my lady asked how many individuals in terms of knowledge uh, were there uh, relevant to the fault-based allegations in the MPOC. My lady, it's, it's difficult to be precise because some of the, the allegations obviously could involve a number of people, but doing the best we can to assist the court, it looks as if it may be subject to further checking and work in the region of 30. Looked to me more like there were a couple of um, main targets, certainly under 10 if you look at the main ones, but I could see how you could extend it. Yes, well, um, I hope A couple that's... of repeat references to individuals, right. but yeah, <coughs> that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, my Lord, Lord Justice Popper was asking questions about identifying claimants who fall out with the um, claimants claims which fall out with the novel system uh, which covers 99.3 percent the difficulty we have doing that is that the data we actually have is not entirely reliable so I don't think it would be of immediate help although we will look at it further over the course of today and tomorrow to try and identify who that 1200 rough number might be. So as matters stand, we simply don't have a, a, a reliable enough database to give you that precise information. But what I, I did want to just show you, um, you've heard a lot of reference to the 30th of October judgment, uh, which is the judgment referred to in Caliph 1, in, in which Judge Mario rolled out the novel system and it's summarized in paragraph 25 of Caliph 1. Um, that judgment is quite a long judgment. It's, it's now in the P bundle, at, I hope, uh, at divider 79, um, page 3749. And would it, would it be of assistance if I provided a route map of that judgment similar to the uh, by Shuguandu route map. 
Uh, well, I think the only honest answer is potentially. <laughs> Until you see. But um, I, I, more practically, if you're saying, uh, we'll, should you do one? I think the answer is yes. I've done one. You've um, done one. I, I use them. I, I, I find without them, it's quite often quite difficult to orientate one's way through quickly. Um, I wanted to just have time to check that it was as balanced as it might be, as it were. But yes, um, it's intended to be exactly the same as Annex 4, which we saw yesterday. Annex 4 wasn't an agreed document as such. No, this isn't either, but you... We put it in below and it's never been objected yes, to. Yes, And yeah. my instructions are that it should be as neutral as possible and make sure it quotes rather yeah. than summarises wherever possible. Yeah. So we'll do that. And you, you have the... Do you have the judgment there in the P-bundle, my lord? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, because... I just wanted to show you one part of it. Oh, wait a moment. No, um, which tab did you say? I'm hoping. Or which page? In other words, anything. Tab 79. Uh, tab 79 is the whole of ES ECF1, which is the one we asked for. Is the judgment in it? I think yes, it is. Yes, it is. It is, it is. It is. It is. It is. yes. Uh, but which page is what I'm asking for? 3749. It, it is... I do apologise, I've only just been handed this judgment. This, um, it's, the, it's decision PA number 7. Yep. Is that right? Yes. Yep. That, that is it. Yep, thank you. Um, and... Could you go to page... Yes. Three seven seven eight. One, one moment, please. Yes, it's three seven seven eight. <laughs> And I, it, I just wanted you to note what Judge Mario is saying about the parallel operation of PIM and the novel system in his 30th October judgment at the bottom of 3778 and over the page into 3779 in view of questions yesterday about how they operate together. And... Uh, what he says at the bottom of 3778 is, in this context, it is clear that the maintenance of PIM in coexistence with the novel and other local indemnity programmes is a healthy measure, very important for those affected to have freedom of choice as to the indemnity model which best suits them. And then he says over the page, while the novel turns more to low, sufficient informal categories, devoid of material proof, the target audience of PIM is those affected that are documented, formalised, who are able to satisfactorily prove material evidence of the damage they claim to have experienced. And he stresses, don't mix, don't confuse. They're different. And it's in that context that he made further orders relating to expedited registration for those qualifying for PIM. So you can't be in novel and in PIM? I'm sorry, my lady. You can't be in novel and in PIM? No, you can't. Once you've signed the release, I mean, you, you could... Once you've signed the release in novel, you couldn't, or PIM, you can't then claim. Right, but what if you haven't signed any releases? The, this, is, this sounds as if they're two very different tracks. Novel is rough justice. Novel, what it says on the tin, it's new, it's, it's rough and ready because you can't prove your <coughs> claim in a normal way. It's a mediated programme. PIM is more formal, where you can, as one might say, in the normal way, prove your claim. Yes. 
So, what you, you can have one foot in each camp, can you? At the same time, doesn't no, it? No, you like can't. It? No, yeah. you, you go for one or the other. How about, how about that? Oh, well, that I'm sounds not. realistic, but well, you can. Well, I wonder. Yeah. What you couldn't do as a bargain is to sign the release. You could be a. The, it crystallizes when you sign the release. Once you've signed yes. the release, yeah. you couldn't then. No, but let's say you sign other, no releases could, with anybody. If you sign no, no releases, you wouldn't. I don't think you'd get paid. No, but if you're seeking a mediated outcome, you could try under both. Either you, you say you could try both you, you at the could, same you, time. You could try both. Why? Because yeah. it says, despite being complementary, don't mix, don't confuse, um, and they are aimed at two completely different audiences. Well, I, I'm simply answering strictly your ladyship's question. That, that, that may, may be right, and Judge Mario is clearly seeking to ensure that people understand the differences. But I'm taking instructions as I speak. I understand that there's still nothing to stop you having a go at both. Well, realistically, of course, but you'll have. To uh, there will have been a lot of people in PIM, a lot of people in PIM, but not so many having got any results. It's so difficult. A lot of people in PIM when he devises the novel system. That's why he devises the novel system. Yes. So the likelihood. So he, it it doesn't. You know, Looking at it historically, it seems unlikely he devised the novel system only for those who hadn't already signed up for PIM. Right. Um, so that, uh, uh, and then PIM, although it's not to close straight away, is to close quite shortly. The question of people actually signing up for both might be secondary. But in principle, I can see why he wanted both to be available. Yes. Even though it's rather messy. Yes. I think. But it's perhaps not as so messy in real life. They'll actually put their effort into one rather than the other and get a result in one and then give up the other. Yes, that's my understanding. That's me thinking aloud. I'm getting some nods from the back. But one of the en I'm reminded that one of the entry requirements of novel is that you have tried to register with PIM or, or file the court proceedings by a particular date. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, the important thing is it's available. <laughs> yes, quite. To the claims. So that that is that question, so far as it goes, and we'll provide the route map in relation to that. Lady Justice Carr asked for uh, the references in relation to the expert disagreement on clauses 99 and 103, and that those we will be giving, and Mr. Toledano will be dealing with those further in the light of the Article 34 submissions. I think that is it, uh, except for this. During the course of my overview yesterday, the court asked me about two matters uh, which I wish to address further. The first is the point my Lord, Lord Justice Popperwell made yesterday, that merely because, in summary, Sir Marco and Renova may have accepted and not denied the obligation to make full redress, that might change. And the second is the 13 large businesses. Uh, as you know, these are the only claimants to which Sir Marco says it has or will deny liability in Brazil if Fundau Dam claims are brought. And I confirm that what I said yesterday was correct, that Sir Marco considers that the strict liability provisions under Brazilian environmental law, as I understand it, would not apply to these large commercial claims. And as, as you know from AD, uh, Mr. De Freitas' third statement, Renova says it does not deny the obligation to make full redress to any and all of the English claimants, including the 13, um, subject obviously to establishing causation and loss. So you've, you've had my answers on both of these points. Um, the fact that it's not in dispute that Samarco and Renova accept and do not deny the obligation to make full redress to those affected and that is recorded in the judgment at 132 and 133, which we don't understand to be seriously challenged. That is the position that Samarco and Renova have taken for many years in tens of thousands of judgments, and very significant sums have been paid out. And we respectfully submit that there's no reason to infer, based on those key facts, that Samarco or Renova uh, will nonetheless, despite all that's been said and done, change their stance. Oh, sorry, and I'll um, come back. It's 
<laughs> the 13 large businesses have not received anything from anybody. They haven't brought any proceedings related to Fundau Dam. No, so, so, so there's been no uh, acceptance or rejection of that. But De Freitas's uh, third witness statement was not before the judge. But you say we should... No, no. We the should, 13, we should... So the 13, the position, the, 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 the position taken by Mr De Freitas in paragraph 17 of De Freitas 3 was not before the judge. And I'm coming to that. And on that point, um, so far as the 13 are concerned, uh, this was not a point ever relied on by the claimants below, even though they knew about the 13. Um, and indeed, the claimant's stance below was that Sir Marco's liability as direct polluter was undeniable. Well, uh, I've shown well, you... That was Mr Hollander's submission in the way... It, and we may need to look at the full transcript, but you can see how... <laughs> It was a well, passing comment almost, I think, in context, if you read the full transcript. Um, well, I haven't shown you Appendix 20, no. because they produced one of their hand-ups, and there were quite a lot of hand-ups, and uh, late in the day they produced Appendix 20, which was where the Samarco is unable to pay point emerged on day seven, and that um, uh, also included a very stark um, averment in relation to the fact that Samarco was a direct polluter and that liability had been established against it or that it couldn't deny liability. So it was the claimant's position mm -hmm. before the judge. But I, I have a solution, my lady, which I'm coming to. Uh, but I, I need you to We're still up. on the recitals at the moment. We're still on the recital, as it were, and I appreciate the tensions building. Um, <laughs> but we, we, do, we do submit that the position is, is, is clear on the evidence. And uh, obviously, Mr. De Freitas would not have said what he said in a witness statement unless he was satisfied he was able to make that statement on behalf of Renova. But assume against me that uh, those points are still not satisfactory uh, to the court for whatever reason. An answer in my submission, and a just answer, would be to stay these proceedings to prevent an abuse of process rather than a strikeout. In other words, if what we respectfully submit is a speculative possibility that Samarco and Renova changed stance and effectively are not good to their word came to pass, then the claimants could come back to court. And indeed, a stay to prevent abuse was the alternative basis on, what, on which the defendants succeeded below. And that's recorded in paragraph one of the order under appeal. Where, the, where it's recorded that the claims are struck out as an abuse of process under CPR 3.42b, and it goes on, the order at A stroke 8 stroke 214, had the claims not been struck out, they would have been stayed as an abuse of process on the basis described in paragraph 265, Roman numeral 2 of the judgment. And in 265, the judge said, if my finding of abuse were correct, but my decision to strike out were wrong, then I would stay the claims, leaving open the possibility of the claimants, or some of them, seeking to lift the stay, but without predetermining the timing of any such application or the circumstances in which such an application would be liable to succeed. And obviously it would be a matter for this court um, how to approach that. So you've heard the primary way in which I put my case, that, that the appropriate order is a is a strikeout, but in, in view of the, different, the the points that have been raised, in my submission, this is an alternative that is open to this court on the, this appeal, um, and, and I respectfully commend it to you because it does meet the uh, concerns that have been expressed, I, I submit. Um, it also meets the concern that my lady has expressed about limitation. The, the short answer is that the claimants haven't argued in, this, uh, in these proceedings that there are limitation bars. Um, that, that, that as far as we're aware, there are no proceedings in Brazil where the point has been taken. And obviously, it would be inconsistent with the denial for it to have been taken. But again, I don't propose to go into it, because uh, that would also obviously be a basis for returning to court if a stay on the grounds I've suggested were the outcome. What, um, what, when, what date were these proceedings commenced in England? 
What, what date? Yes, Sorry, I, I, I'm just I, I don't know. Just well, it's either, it's either November 2018 or yes. May 2019. There are different dates. The first date I'll, I'll, I'll get. Uh, so, November 2018 for some. Well, there were some claims in November 2018. In England. In England, and then they were superseded, if I understood yes, they right, were. by the single claim form that survives, so which they, was both issued and served in May 2019. So are there any, right. is there any limitation issue in this country? In relation to claims against Limited and PLC, I understand there could be. And, and are you in a position to say, well, I mean, this is one of the difficulties now. I mean, will, will limitation be taken if the proceedings continue? In England? In England? Yeah. Yes, limitation could be right. taken in England. Right. And it follows, therefore, that any claims that are started here after in Brazil will face the same yeah. limitation mm. defence. Yeah. No, well, what I'm saying is we, it, they, they, it hasn't been taken and it wouldn't be taken as part of the denial. Well, it would be taken in England by these companies, but it wouldn't be taken by the subsidiary companies. Well, I can't, I can't well, may I take further question? I, I, don't, I can't rule out the position in, in, in this no, jurisdiction. Well, that's why I'm pressing it's one of the, one of the well, prematurity what, what, what problems. I'm, Quite an important point, potentially. The, the position in relation to these claimants bringing their proceedings in Brazil is, as I've said, there will be no denial of liability. But if there is any change of position in relation to that, and there won't be, but if there were to be, um, that would be covered by the stay. Yeah. But in this, in, sorry. But, but I'm just really repeating what you said. In this country. Your understanding is that it, there is a limitation point that could be taken, and you do you cannot say at this stage whether it will be or would be. There may so, be. Have, have I, have I yes, you have correctly. There, there could be. Yeah. I mean, there couldn't be in relation to proceedings issued in before the fifth of November two thousand and eighteen. Well, the claimants have said. But there are no limits. Their position is obviously that there is no proper limitation defence can be taken. Yes. What, I, what I can't rule out standing here now is that in relation to the proceedings in this country, there would be no limitation points arising. What I am making clear to the court, I hope, is that so far as the position in Brazil is concerned, that will not happen. It has not happened. And to cure any concerns about that, yeah. there could be a stay. That, that's, that's something you say we should conclude on the evidence rather than anything you've got any instructions. I'm sorry, my lord. That's something you say we should conclude, the Brazil side of it. You say that's the conclusion the court should reach by virtue of what's happened so far. Yes. Not, not something that you can assist no. on by way of instructions. No. no they, I say you should conclude it based on everything that's been put in evidence so far and what's happened so far. No one's ever said that. It, but it's not, so far as I know, there's no case in which the point has been taken. So I rely on all my primary arguments as to why the action should in fact be struck out. But if that, if there is any vestige of concern in relation to these matters, um, in my submission they could be, that could be met by a stay. Do I recall correctly that, that somewhere in the course of pointing out the difficulties of having to have a liability issue Bought in this country, when whereas um, it all conceded in Brazil, but I think the judge said, or certainly the underlying evidence said, and one of the issues that may arise in this country it's is limitation, limitation, which may arise. Yes, that's now, why I can't rule it out. No, but I'm, am I, it, it hasn't. This hasn't come out of your mouth for the first time. Now, am I? Is this a phantom memory, or did the judge himself refer to it? No, the, the, I, I'd have to check whether the judge referred to it, but it's certainly. Um, it's certainly referred to in Michael Five, I think, where yes, he goes I saw it through, somewhere. He go now where he goes through some of the issues that might arise for the claimants here. Could could, could those behind you identify where um, the possibility yes of a limitation defence being run in this country was referred to in the evidence or the yes. submissions before the judge and yeah. or adopted by the judge? Yes, we certainly can. Uh, I'm trying to remember whether I could, he may put it in the judgment. I don't think he did, but um, I've seen. I think I've seen it somewhere, but it yes, may not. Yes, you have seen it in Michael Five. Yeah, it's not in the judgment. I'm pretty sure it's not. It's in the Michael judgment. Five, and uh, yes, we can give you the references for that. And is there any expert law on Brazilian limitation? 
uh, principles and extensions and all that sort of thing? No, because it wasn't a point that was being taken and argued below. Or indeed in this appeal. No. Uh, I literally, we, we, we've addressed it overnight. I mean, the first time I actually have I'm focused on it, obviously, until this moment, but the first time I'd actually ever seen what Brazilian law was, was the questionnaire which we saw by chance on, on another point this morning, where, where, where they say um, it's three years, and that's why we're going to start before the 5th of November. Yeah. Uh, out of caution, because there may be answers to it. That's roughly, that's roughly what you said, isn't it? Yes. That's all we really know, yes. as far as I think we've seen. Yeah. But, as I say, it, it, is a, it is a point that will not be taken based on the evidence before the court, but any concerns can be addressed through a stay, I submit. It's paragraph 1451 of Michael 5 is the reference that your Lordship has... The one four five one. Thank you. I'm told. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, that's pretty explicit. There will be a significant issue as to Brazilian limitation law with respect to the claims being brought against BHP. BHP uh, yes, 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 sorry. PLC. Yes. BHP. Yes. <laughs> 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 yes. 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 Limited. Yes. Yes. Right. Sorry, I've been slow. No. Yep. It is not a point that Samarco oh. or Nova have taken or will take. It's a time. I've just been blanked at my pen. Risk of repeating right. myself. Thank you. So that's good news for the claimants. So those are the initial matters. Just before you move on, can I make a plea to have the documents that are added to my bundles not double-sided, single-sided? Yes, of course not. Sorry, if you're waiting for me, please don't. Um, well, I now move on to parts um, four and five of my judgment, and I'll deal with the uh, jurisdiction issue of law in the, co in, in the context of this, these parts. Um, and, and I start with the, uh, the judgment, if I, if I may. Uh, at A9217. I don't know to what, to what extent this is in dispute or, or necessary in the light of our respondent's notice, um, but in our submission, and as is clear from the conclusory paragraph, the ultimate conclusion of the judge was that this litigation provided no realistic prospect of tangible benefit, which outweighed its disadvantages to the courts and the parties, and one sees just taking some of these paragraphs at a counter, if that's convenient. Uh, one sees him at paragraph 43 on page 227, uh, identifying the, the way the claimants, the defendants, I'm sorry. I, I'm well, so sorry, just before you get started, that was so important to keep control of one's documents. While you were addressing us on other points, 
Appendix 1 to the fifth statement that Mr. Michael just handed up, was that in anticipation of something that will eventually go into Part no, B? No, it, it was purely for the questionnaire point because I was concerned that it was that the that the, the, the um, question 45 was too small. So you have that in your bundle, but you no, have it's a no, no, it's a different document. Oh, it's the conclusion appendix one. What do we do in the It shows that it's stat. That I'm told is the appendix I tried to take you to initially to show you the word concluded. Yes. And that includes that. So that it, when it's, it's not paginated. So we don't I think the sensible thing yet. would yes, be: we are. Um, uh, could we have a paginated yes, version? Yes, you can. Then you can single-sided yes. um, uh, uh, which can go in the bundle. Yes, of course. Right. Of course. Tomorrow morning. Sorry. No, my my, my fault, and I apologise for the uh, confusion. So I'm just in the judgment, my lord, of paragraph forty. Three, where the judge, in summary, uh, sets out the defendant's uh, primary contention or one of the primary contentions. And then, as you've seen, in paragraph 59, he introduced and explains the decision in, in Wyeth. And in 63, passage that you've been taken to, whereas in a, B, the choice of defendant brings no benefit to a claimant, but the pursuance of a claim against such a defendant would result in the oppression of that defendant and or would take disproportionate toll on the court's resources. The court is entitled to convene. So in essence, this is the pointless and wasteful test, and the claimants accept in their skeleton at 117B uh, that that is a fair statement of the test from, uh, from Wyeth. So very early on in his analysis, the judge was identifying the test. In our submission, he was looking to see what benefit the claim would bring to the claimants uh, and whether that justified the disadvantages to the parties and the burdens on the court. In 65 to 67, he also then notes the overriding objective uh, and the fact that that chimes with the uh, the, 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 the Jamil approach and test, which echoes what Lord Phillips effectively said in Jamil. Um, and then from 78, the judge goes on to evaluate a number of factors and disadvantages. I'm just focusing at the moment on the fact that the judge had the pointless and wasteful test well in mind. One sees at 99, he cites... Uh, Lord Phillips in Jamil, and you've been taken to that. And he also deals with the choosing who to sue uh, point and the unfettered choice point, uh, which is, is qualified in the way that's been explained in the authorities. It's also relevant to note that in this section at 107, he also... Uh, when looking at some of the problems and disadvantages, he notes that att attempts may be made to mitigate these consequences, but I'm wholly satisfied they'd achieve very little, if anything. For example, a scheme of compensation, the very formulation of which would in any event depend on the doubtful cooperation of the parties, would run the risk of either significantly duplicating the work of Renova or of generating mutually irreconcilable methods of claim resolution. So he deals with various problems, issues, and, and, and disadvantages. Uh, you'll see that then in 115 he identifies the fact that whatever the chances of any given claimant obtaining full redress in Brazil, it's almost a certainty she will not achieve it in England. With limited exceptions, the claimants have agreed to pay their solicitors a success fee of up to 30% out of any damages recovered in these proceedings. He deals with that and then compares that to the situation at the end of that paragraph. In Brazil, legal aid is available for individual claims and the engagement in the Renova scheme gives rise to no cost liability. Um, he then posits why the claimants may indeed be choosing to come to this country. He says he's not going to take their subjective views into account and he concludes at the end of 119 Whatever the source of the claimant's enthusiasm for the prospect of mitigation in England, which I assume to be genuinely felt, I consider the collective optimism to be deeply and irredeemably flawed. 
and he reaches uh, an interim conclusion at paragraph 120. At 122... Why is it interim? Because he carries on. Yeah, and but it's, it's complete. It's not interim, it's not provisional. Well, I say interim because he then does carry on and take further factors into account and reach his final conclusions. But nothing as was know. ever going to change his mind from that. Nothing that followed was going to alter 120, was it? It was clearly an important factor for him, but he did then take into account the further factors he identified, and it's clear in my submission from, from his wording. And if, if, as I say, if, if, I'm, if, I, if I'm wrong or maybe wrong about that, um, that's what we, why we, for the avoidance of any doubt, put in our respondent's notice. So, um, it's not, uh, paragraph it's not, you don't attempt. The, the, the quotation from Lord Bingham in Barker is not apt, is it? The point he's been making up to that point. It's not entirely clear what he has in mind at that point. Uh, Barker is a collateral attack case. Um, Oh, well, never he's mind. clearly concerned at, the, at this stage. He's clearly concerned at the impact of the proceedings and the way this group action is being progressed, effectively in two jurisdictions. And we see that from what he's been saying up to this point. Um, the concerns about cross contamination and so on, which I'll come back to, but that is clearly featuring in his reasoning. But what then happens is that he then does, under the heading "Full Regress," from one two one through to 135, in my submission, conduct exactly the exercise that was described by my lords in the exchange with Mr Chu Choi uh, on Monday. It doesn't matter, but the, the, the criticism of the first sentence is, is well made, isn't it? It wasn't, it wasn't the claimant's case in response, it was your case, bearing the burden that uh, they would get full redress in Brazil, and therefore these were pointless and wasted. That aspect. It doesn't that, matter. But yeah, that, that is well. Right. Yeah. Um, so one, one, one sees uh, in one two two, you see one two two one the comparative approach point. Whatever the problems in Brazil, which he's about to consider, they will not be alleviated by, as he puts it, opening up a second front. Um, and he, he, t he talks in 1222 um, of what he describes as the symmetry, the inevitable and fearful symmetry. Perhaps with William Blake in mind, I don't know, but he's clearly concerned uh, at the, the, the effects, not just on the English courts, but also on the Brazilian courts. And um, it's, it's at this stage he makes some important uh, findings relevant to the processes that uh, I took you to yesterday. Um, uh, first of all, in 1222, as it still is, on page 248, he talks about some of the uh, cross-contamination difficulties in that paragraph. Um, in, in cases in which the number of claimants is much lower, such adjustments and recalculations might be more straightforward, but with tens of thousands of potential conflicts, the impact is likely to be significant. Um, he, he then, in one, two, three, moves to consider uh, the 12th Federal Court. And um, I expanded on some of these points yesterday. <coughs> and he could have expanded on them further, but in my submission, it wasn't necessary for him to do so. But he made the important findings that um, the 12, uh, four lines down, one, two, three, the 12 federal court to which the 20 billion and 155 have been allocated is through the efforts of Judge Mario seeking to devise and deploy several procedural innovations in order to improve and streamline the process. He then deals with the priority axes, identifies priority axis seven, and refers to the local commissions and rough justice. Um, Judge Mario seeks to insist, he says at the bottom, that any claimant wishing to take advantage of the rough justice scheme must give up any claims which they brought in England. He's clearly concerned about running claims in parallel would have a deleterious impact on the fair and just resolution of claims in Brazil. I share those concerns. Um, he, he then 
sets out the, the, the fact that there is a, a great deal of evidence about how long it will take for proceedings to be resolved um, and the satisfactory resolution of outstanding claims in Brazil and so on. And against that backdrop, he makes his uh, a number of key points. And uh, in my submission, uh, we'll look at them a bit further, but in, in terms of the availability of redress in, for individualized assessments and the small claims courts and state courts, he identifies key statistics in 126, that's the 27,000 in four, at 414 days statistic. The fact that on the present evidence available, just under half have already accepted payments, and you've seen that, and so on. And, and what, what he then does is to deal with the two, really only two, or the main two, delay points that were being made. And one was the IRDR delay point, and he deals with that um, in paragraph 127. And that's not really being challenged at all. Uh, and in short, it certainly couldn't justify bringing the proceedings in this country because whatever the delay there may be for some of the claimants in relation to the IRDR in Menas uh, it's, it, it's inconceivable that it could approach the delays that would be, will occur in this jurisdiction. And then at 128, he deals with an, another argument in relation to 104 as to whether individual claims would be stayed if a related CPA was progressing. And again, he essentially dismissed that on the basis of um, the uh, undisputed facts to the fact that there was not a single claimant in the present action whose individual claim had been stayed on this basis. Um, so again, that hasn't, neither of these points have really been challenged on this appeal at all. Um, he then continues to look at the position comparing, in effect, the position in Brazil with England and makes some further important findings in 131 about Judge Mario, again not challenged or questioned that he's in 131 intolerant of delay and his approach is a cause for confidence that the impetus he's giving the process will continue. And, and as you've seen from the development since the judgment, that's certainly been borne out by the way in which the local commission claims in particular and novel, the novel system has progressed. Um, he makes a finding in relation to, we, we submit in relation to Renova at the end of 131. Um, and then you have the two findings in 132 and 133, which you've already been taken to uh, by me, um, which are crucial to the pointless and wasteful um, analysis, as I've sought to show you. Then he makes the findings that I've shown you in paragraph 134, about Renova leading to 1347, and then he makes, starts making important comparator finding in 135, permitting the claimants to bring proceedings against these defendants in England would not provide a panacea. None of the concerns identified on behalf of the claimants are liable to be significantly obviated. Indeed, the English proceedings would, on balance, generate even greater challenges. And then he deals with the liability hurdle the claimants would have no chance of any redress until the issue of liability of these defendants had been resolved as a matter of Brazilian law. The question of itself would take a considerable time to resolve. If they were to fail, the whole process would have given rise to a massive waste of time and money. He then leads to the fact, moves on in 1352 to the fact that then they have to face further stages, um, and which he, he, he says would also foul the progress of parallel proceedings in Brazil. He then deals with the, the 58 and essentially treats them as the same, and I'll come to them separately. And it's at this point that he reaches his final conclusions in my submission. He pays full regard to the challenges of those wishing to bring claims in Brazil. Um, and he makes the point it would not be appropriate in the context of an application uh, in which the calling of cross-examining witnesses, both lay and expert, is precluded to descend in any detailed adjudication upon the precise extent of such challenges. But then he concludes, uh, having accepted that subjective concerns are genuine, I am entirely satisfied, and this in my submission is a 
legally correct application of the objective requisite objective test we discussed yesterday, that their confidence that anything of value is to be achieved in England is illusory. And then he goes on and... So that's his pointless and wasteful finding. Well, that is, I would submit, as is also 142 and 141, because in 141 he's looking at the disadvantages and burdens of the pointless and wasteful te test, in particular the claimant's tactical decision to progress closely related damages claims in the Brazilian and English jurisdictions simultaneously is an initiative, the consequence of which, if unchecked, would foist upon the English courts the largest white elephant in the history of group actions, a, a, a pointless and wasteful burden. Um, in addition, it would, in my view, be manifestly unfair to the defendant to be required to engage in a massively expensive and protracted litigation, and this, in my submission, is further application of the Jamil Schellenberg test, devoid of any realistic promise of substantive advantage to the claimant. And there are his pointless and wasteful findings. The other strand to his decision, uh, as, as I think the 5230 court also well, it, uh, accepted, um, and um, we support that for the reasons he gave, but it, it, insofar as we, we need to elevate any of his observations or points in the paragraphs 121 through to 135 into findings, we rely on our respondent's notice. He then deals with the option to stay in 144, and um, he decides against that for the reasons he gives. And, um, uh, and although I've shown you his... His, his order. It's also worth just noting what he says uh, la later in his judgment, a paragraph 213, page 273. In the context of the 80, 80, 80, article 34 discussion, the central reason why the claimants will not commence proceedings against these two defendants in Brazil is that they would there face the additional hurdle of having to prove that they were liable as indirect polluters or otherwise, but with no attendant advantage. It would be pointless to assume such an additional burden when all the other means of redress in Brazil provide, in practice, no such challenge. This explains why out of the many tens of thousands of actions commenced in Brazil, no more than a dozen or so have been commenced against PLC or Limited. So in, in my submission, that is another part of his judgment where he uh, accurately encapsulates the pointless and wasteful test. So insofar as it matters in relation to, given that we have a respondent's notice, we respectfully submit that ground one of this appeal and all those that are parasitic on it, namely unmanageability, being the sole reason for the strikeout, uh, is, is not made out. So with that introduction to the judgment and having dealt with um, ground one, uh, could I look at the uh, evaluation of pointless and wasteful, uh, both by the, uh, the judge uh, and uh, having regard to uh, the points which are, were, are in his judgment, but which we rely on pursuant to our respondent's notice. Um, and what I'm focusing now is the no tangible benefit limb, as it were, uh, by where, and, and I'm focusing on what is and, and, and is was. This, is this five, area five of your submission? I'm moving, I'm in area five, yes. What was and is available in Brazil now by way of full redress, which renders this claim pointless and therefore wasteful. And as you know, the routes to redress that we rely on are Renova, namely the PIM and Novel Scheme, and the local court proceedings in either the Small Claims Court or the State Court. And we've, we've noted it as a third route to redress, although, although strictly it's a supplement to the first route to redress, namely uh, PIM or novel, the novel system, namely improvements to, to the um, to Renova, which, as I sh showed you yesterday, are being uh, carried.
carried out through the 155. That's priority axis 7 and the different ways in which Judge Mario is seeking to improve Renova and as a result also devise the novel system. But that's not a separate individual route to address, I accept. I, it's, it's one of the ways in which the key Renova route to address is being improved all the time under court supervision. So if we could go to uh, and to do this, I think, from paragraph 78 uh, of our skeleton. And that's at... Uh, A6, stroke, page 148. And this is in section C2 as part of what we call the evaluative analysis. And I've already made a number of these points, but if I could draw them together in a moment, but before doing so, could I just say, make a few introductory comments about... Uh, the need for a scheme and factors that, in my submission, the court should have regard. Schemes exist to relieve the pressure on the courts. It's extremely difficult for any court system, we submit, to conduct hundreds of thousands of individual quantum trials proportionately and efficiently. And an important way of ensuring that thousands of individual claims can be assessed and quantified in a proportionate manner is through a scheme. So it's in the public interest and the party's private interests that a substantial number of claims are processed or processable through a scheme. And so far as the claimant's interests are concerned, they're self-evidently well served by a scheme when it's free, and in particular if it makes it easier for them to prove uh, loss where they may otherwise have dif difficulty uh, in, in a court. And we respectfully submit that such considerations have clearly driven the claimant's representatives in <coughs> Brazil, the key stakeholders in Brazil, and the managing judge of the 12th Federal Court. Um, and you, I made the submission on Monday, when one's looking at the tangible benefit or any realistic prospect of the tangible benefit, it is obviously of major importance that a key problem for the claimants here is that there already are two schemes, as I've shown you, uh, in, in, in Brazil. And in any event, the English court is simply not in a position to impose, nor in my submission would it realistically, impose a third scheme, which, as the judge rightly said, would only have the effect, or could only have the effect, even if it could be done, of undermining, potentially undermining, uh, the schemes already operating and being under constant supervision and improvement uh, in Brazil uh, in the way that uh, you have heard described. Uh, and I've taken you to the key developments, which include the ongoing negotiations which are going on under the auspices of the CNJ. So coming back to the advantages of Renova and the novel system, and having been through these in, in, in more detail with the facts, I think I can take them by reference to my skeleton um, shortly, and the, the court will be well aware of what informs each point. The first point um, is the obligation to make full redress, uh, and in that regard in particular, we also rely on the judge's finding, as I've shown you in 132 of the judgment. Um, secondly, we submit it's relevant how many of the claimants have had recourse to Renova and the fact that uh, they have made it clear they wish to continue to do so during the continuance of this uh, action. Uh, so they're seeking to take advantage of it. Uh, just, just pausing for a moment, this is the type of point I submit the judge may well have had in mind when he 
referred to Barker and using the court proceedings in a way that is in the way he described. This essentially it's 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 the it's the parallel litigation point or the parallel use of redress point. Um, the third point which you, you saw me underline by reference to the GTAC is that Renova has stakeholder support. Um, Fourth, it's subject to judicial supervision uh, and in ongoing improvement. Uh, I took you to and explained how those improvements in the 155 were being effected, in particular in a relevant sense through Axis, Priority Axis 7, which has fruited into the local commission claims and the novel system as you've seen. And that's an area, as we say in our skeleton, where the judge's findings are well made, we, we, we submit, where he says Judge Mario's persistence and determination is evident, both from the tone and content and timing of his judgments and the procedural initiatives he is seeking to introduce. Next, we make the point that um, Renova is free to use. It provides a more flexible route than tra traditional court proceedings. And you've seen the way, as I showed you this morning, in which Judge Mario sees it now progressing. And it's open to all the claimants in tandem with the novel system and the important role he considers that it plays in giving the claimants a, a choice, uh, a, a greater choice, I would submit, than would often be available to compensation schemes and local courts. Uh, given the circumstances, uh, but of course, as, as, as we've said on a number of occasions, uh, the claimants, if they don't wish to take advantage of one of Renova's matrices of the PIM scheme, they can simply elect to prove their loss through it. And if they don't feel satisfied with that, they can go to court. Uh, but if these claimants were to use Renova now, they would have the benefit of Judge Mario's <coughs> improved appeal system, uh, which I told you about yesterday. Uh, and then finally, uh, we refer to the uh, novel system as a further uh, route available to these claimants. And I've shown you the, uh, the relevant uh, updates. So there's really common ground in this case in, to, to, to a significant degree as to all of those matters. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of having, in, in highlighting those key factors, I'm not highlighting a, a single matter which is uh, a part of a hot debate or disputed. Uh, and that, that's why I said at the outset that my purpose in going through the facts was to demonstrate to you that these key matters uh, are either common ground or not disputed. And these are the key matters that I submit also the judge either expressly referred to or clearly had uh, well in mind uh, when referring to Renova and making the findings he did, in particular in 115, uh, 121, 123, uh, and 134. So that is the first major route to redress effective and adequate, not perfect, but effective and adequate compensation uh, schemes. Any concerns about the need to be improvement are the subject of the CNJ negotiations uh, as we speak uh, under the overall auspices of Brazil's senior Supreme Court judge. So, there's no liability hurdle, it's free, those routes are available to the claimants. But if they're not satisfied, for whatever reason, with those two routes, and that is paragraph 79 of our skeleton, they can go to a local court where they will be able to uh, 
prove, seek to prove their loss, have an individualised loss assessment before a local court uh, with the benefit of legal aid, if they so wish. And we then highlight the key relevant features to the comparator uh, exercise in paragraph 79 of our skeleton. And of course, the first point we make is that in such claims, the question is not whether Sir Mark or Renova are obliged to make full redress, but causation and, con and quantum based on individual circumstances. In each case, applying Brazilian law, as the English court would have to, the court will determine what amount is to be paid to make full redress to the individuals. And we refer to the fact that the judge clearly took this into account and uh, made a finding in respect of this lack of a liability hurdle in Brazil compared to England in paragraphs 133 and 135. In terms of that liability hurdle, I took you to the MPOC yesterday, but it's worth just looking at what the claimants themselves said about it in paragraph 180 of the judgment where the judge quoted it. And this is what they put in paragraph 484 of their skeleton below, that's page 262 of the bundle. It is accepted, however, that it is very likely that the first question for the court in English action will be the liability of the defendants. That investigation will require a detailed examination of the knowledge and involvement of BHP's English and Australian senior management team in the activities of Samarco and the events leading to the collapse over a period of several years. It will also involve an examination of the financial support given to and derived from Samarco's operations by the BHP group as a whole and an investigation into allegations of negligence and breach of duty by BHP executives. So, in fairness, it is common ground that this is a clearly, I would respectfully submit, a significant liability hurdle in terms of evidence and court time. So in terms of going to local courts, uh, be they small claims courts or state courts, um, that the evidence in relation to that will be uh, covered by, our, um, by the document that we submit to the court. But I'll go to some of the, the key factors. Um, like the judge, um, we rely on the fact that, as we say in paragraph little d on page 151, <coughs> the appellant's own data makes clear that 67,000, as at early 2019, had admitted to, be, to having already brought individual lawsuits in Brazil. About 20,000 claimants have concluded those cases. And none of those 70,000 has put in any evidence to the effect that they had any difficulty getting legal representation or legal aid, as I said yesterday. Um, that, that, in my submission, is, is, is a potent piece of evidence in itself. 
then, as we say in E, in terms of both numbers and duration, you have the fact that 27,000 claims have been adjudicated in Menas Juris in an average of 414 days. Again, we know from the letter that that is a figure that um, started as 82,000. And there's no suggestion that those 82,000 dam-related claims in Minas Gerais had any difficulty getting legal representation um, or sufficient funding to bring their claims. relevant letter, I believe, may, in relation to the 414 days, I believe may now be in a, a bundle. I have the Opus reference. Can I have the... It's P. It's P386, I think. I'm, I'm grateful. Yes, this is where we, 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 we went earlier. Um, this, this is the, the letter. This, uh, this arose because, and it's relied on by the judge in paragraph 126 of his judgment. The president of the courts of Minas Gerais, um, which as you know is where 78% of the claimants at the last count uh, live, um, was asked at the end of 2019 by the Supreme Court President in Brazil in his capacity as President of the National Justice Council to report on the progress of dam cases. So the court will obviously have the point from all the evidence, all the submissions made to date, that the progress and conduct of dam related cases has been a matter of great concern and attention to all major leading leading stakeholders in the justice um, system, including the most senior uh, judges. And the president of the courts of Minas Gerais reported, as the judge observed, and you've seen from the letter, that 27,000 dam claims had been adjudicated in an average of 414 days. Um, there were, as you've seen, 82,000 lawsuits in total, and 43,000 had been stayed due to the IADR. So a nuance is that 12,000 appear to be, on that basis, ongoing, um, that being the difference between the, 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 the figures I've given. Um, my lady asked about the uh, controversy in relation to that, and my, my apologies to Mr. Suarez, uh, that is his name, uh, correctly pronounced. Um, uh, and he, uh, he did take some points and if my learned friend wants to develop them before you I'll leave him to do it in his reply but in, in my submission you will see immediately that his criticisms of the President of the <coughs> Court of Appeals are completely without foundation uh, we addressed them briefly in our Turner Skeleton at 392 and Rezik, uh, Justice Rezik uh, retired Supreme Court judge who was our expert on access to justice issues, um, address them in Resic 2 at paragraph 78.3, that's L stroke 38 stroke 2516, but I respectfully submit you will see immediately that there is really nothing in those criticisms at all. Uh, and you can rely on those uh, uh, figures. So again, coupled with the 82,000 figure, the 70,000 figure, uh, we submit that in itself provides sufficient and powerful evidence, as the judge clearly did, to buttress the submission that if the claimants don't wish to take advantage of firing over, they have a readily, acce readily accessible route to an individualised assessment of their claims before local um, 
uh, before local judges. Uh, just building on that a little just further. Just before we go any further, I just want to make quite sure I understand this figure. All of this generated a bulk of 82,000 whatever lawsuits. What period is covered by that figure? It's up until, yeah, sorry. Up until December 2019. Our understanding is that it's up until December 2019. It's dated well, simply the, because that's the date of the letter. It's dated the 3rd of December 2019. It may well be before that, because you'd have to, they would have had to have um, analysed the data. Um, it could be that of the, ignore the point at the moment about the, um, the IRDR, it could be that of the 60,000 odd whatever it is, 55,000 odd that were not judged, um, some of them were quite recent. Yeah. It, yes, exactly. We just don't know. We just don't know. Um, the 43 odd thousand probably still stayed, aren't they, waiting for the They're waiting Supreme for the Court Sup in, the, in the IRDR? Supreme Court in the IRDR, exactly. My word. It can be assumed, obviously, that those, yes, so those 43,000 must come out of the 55,000. Yes. By definition, they haven't been decided. <coughs> so there are some 12,000, in fact, for which there is an unexplained not necessarily sinisterly unexplained, but there is an unexplained group reason why they haven't got to the end. But one reason might be that they only started quite recently. Well, one, one assumes that's a, certainly one strong contender. Yes, thank you. Sorry, this is all rather obvious stuff, but it's the first no, time no, I've, no, really no, my I, nose I, I've looked at this letter. Rubbed in these figures. Occasions. Um, just one more point. And what, what, what's, what's the reference to the pre procedural sector, CEJ, USC? We think that is a mediation program that the courts initiated in order to deal with certain claims. Yes, it is. Quite separate from the remediation mm -hmm. systems under. Yes, the courts, Renovo. and I'll show you, the courts in Menos Geras uh, have been putting in place different mediation procedures to try and facilitate and help deal with Fundau claims. And Professor Resic deals with that. There's one procedure in particular called GIRD, G I R D, and I'll give you the reference for it. Um, okay, thank you. So that's. One, ad one adds that, and that's why, again, I, forgive me for repeating this, but the, the findings of the judge in 126 in relation to this access, this route, and these two matters, in my submission, the number of claimants who've accessed justice, the, the stats from the most relevant court, from an unimpeachable source, is really sufficient, particularly when the question here is, is not, as it were, an absolute question, it's a comparator question. Yes, I'm just very helpfully told by Mr. Sloboda that if one goes to the document in the penultimate paragraph, he, he, it is it's your Lordship's question and I'm just reading it, he's answered. Yeah, I've already well, looked ahead. That's, but we're dealing with a bit about Brumadinho. Just explaining what that says. It, 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 it's what, explaining what the, the CAGU USC yes. is, yes. Thank you. Judicial Centre for Conflict Resolution and Citizenship. Thanks. It's dealt with in Resic 2 at paragraph. 40. 40. We, we'll produce further references in relation to the availability and ease with which the claimants 
can use these local courts, but we, we pulled it together just for one reference for now. The relevant paragraphs of the Turner skeleton uh, are 81 to 83 at page 48, at 337 to 341, page 119, and at 392, which is the one I think I gave you yesterday, at page 140. Um, as Sorry, far as... Paragraphs 81 to 83, 337 to 341. And 392, my lady. Thank you. Paragraph 392, page 140. 337 to 341, starting at page 119. 81 to 83, starting at page 48. We'll put those in our in our reference document, but just to give give you a flavour of the source material, if that if that would help, if you go to Resic One, which is in the H file, divider 28 and it starts at page 1369 but if you go to page 1393 he starts so, sorry I was just making another note sorry. Oh, where, where, which bundle are we in uh, you're, we're, we're in the H bundle my lord Rosette 1 yep Rosette 1 uh, page 1393 and he starts by just identifying uh, articles of the Brazilian Federal Constitution. And Article 5 states, the state shall provide full and free charge legal assistance to all who have proof insufficiency of funds. And at 83, he identifies that legal aid is presumed upon request there's no particular income criteria. He deals with the ways in which it can be obtained over the subsequent paragraphs. So that's, I don't propose to, to go into it now because it's summarized in our skeleton, but that's, that's where you find uh, the evidence from Justice <coughs> Disrezic. Um, and then while we're in it, uh, at paragraph one two nine he deals with reasonable duration of proceedings. That's page one four oh four, and again that is uh, a requirement of the constitution in Article five, which he cites in paragraph one three one, and then he deals with the procedures at one three seven to achieve reasonable duration. And recently, the Brazilian procedural rules in 2015 went through a, a similar type of, um, not exactly a revolution, what, what, I don't know what one would call what happened to our procedural rules after the Wolf reforms, but certainly major changes were brought in. I hope more effective. Uh, indeed. Um, uh, <laughs> Sorry, no. <laughs> your, your, <laughs> sorry, that was a I, quite I, unnecessary <laughs> note of prophecy <laughs> for a wolf sceptic. Um, um, yes. <laughs> I guess I said that. Well, we can't, I mean, your lordship makes an important the point. Transcript. The, one, <laughs> the, we, are, we are looking at a, a very fair, sophisticated legal system, particularly in the group action, class action context, as I, as I, I hope... Uh, you may, you may be right, but this is not uncontroversial. Exactly. This is not un uncontroversial. As in, no, this is hotly the question of delays, uh, general <clears throat> speed, the efficacy. You're referring to new changes, but there's isn't there expert evidence that says the 2015 changes really weren't terribly effective? Well, and there are huge delays in the proceedings. Is that, is that not right? Well, my lady, I, 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 I was passing through, and um, I, I touched on it just just as by way of introduction. My, my big points, right, are the ones I've already made, and. I uh, see. Sorry, I'm just I, trying to make sure I'm right, that I, I'm not misremembering. 
this yes, is evidence one way and there is evidence the other do way. Dr Jano questions how successful the 2015 yeah. reforms have been. I, I entirely accept that. I'm not trying to say they're a blueprint to answer all the problems. Um, I'm just generally trying to convey the message that they're, they're doing their best. And in my submission, uh, in, in, in dealing with the Fundé dams, succeeding uh, to a very substantial degree. But of course, um, Quite rightly, my lady is not interested in the generalities. Uh, and I understand that, and I agree with that, which is, as I say, where I've been, where I've been. But if you want specifics, uh, you find those uh, on page 1409. And this is the document drafted by the CNJ entitled Justice in Numbers, 2019. Um, and again, you see. Uh, the figures in those paragraphs, and the most relevant ones are over the page at 158 to 161. And one sees in the special courts, which are the, in 158, the, uh, what we also refer to as the small claims courts in Minas Giras, the average duration of proceedings from filing the claim to judgment at first instance is 11 months, which is close to the 414 days that we saw the President of the Court of Appeals referred to. Average appeal to the Special Courts of Appeal is five months. And then in Espiritu Santo, the average duration of filing to judgment is one, one year to 11 months in the, that's in the state courts, in the small claims courts. It's a 161, one year and two months. So that's why we said in our submissions generally, it's about a year, the average. The state courts are a little bit longer in Minas Gerais, as, as one sees from 157. It's three years and four months, because they're for the bigger claims. Um, and, uh, and in Spiritu Santo, it's one year and 11 months. So those are the average figures from CNJ. And It's of a piece. It's of a piece with the with the with the uh, the other information that we've got, the, the hard data we've got that I've taken you to, and I rely on that. And in my submission, even if one doubles it or trebles it, when one is doing the comparator exercise, this is still a far speedier and a far more effective route to an individualised assessment. But there's obviously but no do, read, do these, no, do these no figures read. include dam claims? I'm having trouble squaring this with the fact that uh, over half the claims in Minas Geras haven't yet been decided six years later because they've been stayed. So these, these averages can't take account of those, can they? It, it, it doesn't take account of the stayed ones. Well, does it take account of Excuse any of the dam claims? Well, it well, says average. If, if these purport to be the averages... They, they purport um, to be the averages. They, they, you, can't, you can't square them with the figures in the letter. They may, they may be based on earlier data, and that may be, therefore, we're not looking at that. There, there are many, many, many claims. I, I'll give you the, the actual number, but we're talking, no, no. we're talking about many, many non dan claims, millions. And if we're going to take this, remembering which is strikeout, or equally, not, you know, looking at stays and strikeouts, if you take us to this evidence, do we not then have to look at what is said in response to it? Because yes, that's my next point. Yeah, because, uh, uh, you're right. Sorry. No, because, no. And, and can you say that we can look at Professor Jeannot's response and say the points he makes are simply hopeless? Yes. Right. I say they're hopeless in seeking to demonstrate that there is a realistic prospect of the delays being shorter in England. Well, um, or even that's, that's that's different. I mean, you're saying here are these figures. There's the proof of the pudding. Well, if you look at paragraphs 53 through to 65 of Jano, um, he says these well, figures are, are not helpful. Well, it's interesting to see what he does actually say. But Dr. Jano, there's it's obviously more weighty in my in my estimation than perhaps your ladyship's. But Dr. Jano ha has not uh, debated or disputed the 414 figure. He hasn't, and nor have the claimants argued that the 82,000 figure 
uh, sorry, that the uh, 70,000 figure and the 20,000 who've, who've reached he says they do conclusion not, the have, have been delayed on Justice and numbers duty. figures do not provide a meaningful basis, as my Lord's point, for estimating the length of proceedings in Fendaya in Fendaya related claims for a number of reasons. Well, that, he says that, but I've shown you the uh, Fundau Dam uh, average, which is the 414 days. Well, that's not the average for all of them. No, no the, 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 the majority, majority of them are the still, majority. still, still, uh, still uh, unresolved. Uh, where we are now. But the, 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 the reason, and I, I was going to, and so far as Dr. Jano is concerned, um, you get a good idea of his points from Resic to 98. Uh, he, he makes his points in relation to the availability of legal aid at 119. And you're, you're told. Sorry, well, that's if you want to look at Resic 2. I'd, I'd go to Resic 2 because yes, he does okay. well, fairly well, summarise. Well, take us to it then. That's 98. Which page? Which bundle, though? It's supplementary bundle L, divider 38, 2529. And he makes two points about it. The availability of legal aid. Well, we're not on a different one. point, aren't we? We're, not talking about, we're talking about delays. That's yes, I was, I was taking them in turns. Uh, right, so have, we fin have you finished dealing with Jano's I response? I've finished dealing with delay from the our point of view, right. and I'm now going to deal with Jano's criticisms. Sorry, I should have made that clearer. First of all, dealing with uh, legal aid, and Resic 298 Supplementary Bundle L 2529, and essentially... Um, Jano Tate makes two, two points, and they are addressed by Dr. Rezik, uh, Justice Rezik, in his statement at paragraph 98. Um, the, the first point is he accepts that legal aid would cover the cost of an independent court-appointed expert witness were one needed, but he says legal aid would not cover the cost of an expert where a suitable court-appointed expert was not available. This doesn't make a sense. There can be no case where a court-appointed expert was not available. Independent experts in Brazil are appointed by the court. Article 156 states that a judge is to be assisted by a court-appointed expert when the evidence of the fact depends on technical and scientific knowledge. There's a register of such experts maintained by the court, and when there's not a suitable expert in the register, the appointed expert is freely chosen by the judge and must go to a professional technical scientific body that has proven knowledge necessary for the production of the expert evidence. So he deals with that point, and then Dr. Jano's only other point on the availability of legal aid is essentially to say that it's exactly the same as our old legal aid provisions, whereby if within five years the other party can prove the recipient is no longer impecunious, he could seek uh, costs. So those are the two points that were taken in relation to, uh, to, to, to that. Then... So far as reasonable duration is concerned, and the, the stats that I've shown your lady and my lords, uh, Justice Resic deals with those points at page 2507. And essentially, Dr. Jano, I mean, your, your, your ladyship, my lords, will, will look at his points, but uh, he, he, he raises potential issues with the figures. He, he says it, it does, it's not absolutely clear what is meant by pending. He says you can't aggregate first instance case durations and appeal durations, but they haven't been at 64, 65. The average is strongly influenced by extreme figures, he says, 65. Um, so he does take certain points. I, I, I accept that, but and but they couldn't cause one on a strike to say that these figures are undermined to the extent it would be required to enable the claimants to say that it's not clear and obvious that A, proceedings in the small claim courts, the overwhelming probability is that they would be heard within a reasonable time, 
and B, it's clear and obvious that they will be heard quicker than any claim for an individualised assessment in England. Had, did Dr. Jano take the point which my Lord took, that the figures in the um, justice by numbers are difficult to reconcile with the um, figures for delay in the... Um, no. So, as he didn't take it, Justice Rezek didn't answer it? No. I mean, yes. Okay. Um, so, while... While we're in Resit 2, it might be worth just noting paragraph 108 on page 2533, where Justice Resic makes the point at 108.1, at least as regards the individuals affected by the Fundau Dam collapse, my understanding from public information is that these issues are being specifically addressed by the formation of the Rio Doce Defensory Group, GERD, in 2016 to ensure active participation of the Public Defender's Office in securing compensation for Fundau victims. GERD integrates the public defenders in the states of Minas Geras, Espiritu Santo and the Federal Union, seeking coordinated and strategic action to provide assistance to those people affected. GERD also monitors the processes of the technical commissions that support Renova's Interfederative Committee. GERD is active in Minas Geras and Espiritu Santo, including holding meetings with affected people and representative groups. GERD, according to the coordinator at the Public Defender's Office of the Ministeris Luciana Leo Lara Luce, was important for, and then there's a quote from that. It's not conclusive, but it's just further evidence of the, of the extent to which the Brazilian justice system is seeking to progress and expedite fund our damn claims in these two states and have been over some years. set of proceedings of common issues of fact. Professor Didier did deal with that uh, in his first report at paragraph 232, I, I think is the part answer to your question, that's H271342, where he says the Brazilian justice system has several methods, this is 229 on page 1342, to ensure that liquidation proceedings can be resolved speedily and consistently, even when there are large numbers of victims who wish to liquidate their claims. First, as I've mentioned, there can be collective liquidation proceedings under Article 7 of the CDC. For an example, an association representing fishermen of a particular area may bring collective liquidation proceedings on behalf of the fishermen from that area. An award made in collective liquidation proceedings under Article 97 would then be distributed to the individual victims. The advantage of collective liquidation proceedings is that it avoids the needs for multiple actions brought by each individual victim. Second, even bearing in mind the possibility of collective liquidation, it's likely that in a case such as the 155, a large multiplicity of individual liquidation actions will be filed in different state courts. To resolve these cases efficiently and consistently, the Brazilian courts can make use of national judicial cooperation procedure in Article 69, and then he refers uh, to that, whereby courts dealing with many individual or indeed collective liquidation proceedings can agree a list of common factual issues which arise in all or many of the proceedings before them, and they can agree that common evidence should be produced and used in those proceedings. The courts would then make their decisions on the basis of that evidence. 
the advantage of this procedure is that it avoids the need for liquid for separate evidence being produced or common questions in each individual liquidation action and that it aids consistency of outcome. For these reasons, in my view, the Court would make use of this procedure in liquidation proceedings following a judgment in the 155. Yes, in Article 69, he says the Court's going to agree to m centralise multiple claims in one court. This would involve the Court's agreeing that one court should decide all or a subset of all liquidation actions filed in the 155. This would ensure consistency of outcome and so on. And he picks up on that theme dealing with Professor Rose's counterpoints, which, which I accept were made, uh, in DDA 2, I'll just give you the, re the reference, paragraph 311. Yes, those, those are the references you gave us a little earlier. Oh, did I? Yes. I, yes. I, I, um, I haven't, so I that's, that's what he's referring to there. And but you haven't got the, you haven't got the Rose of references for it. Uh, they are in the DDA 2. He refers to the paragraphs where Professor Rose has taken, uh, not exactly a different view, but as suggested there because they made well, a difference. This is, a, this is another one for the agenda, isn't it? Because we well, could get them all into one place. My Lord, it's, it's perhaps... But thank you, I'd, I'd lost yes. sight of that. The first group action in this country, as this court well knows, was the Yopran litigation in, in the 1980s. And at that time, we had no GLO procedures. Um, and Mr Justice Hurst, in that litigation, devised procedures, co what he called coordinated arrangements, pursuant to the inherent jurisdiction of the court. Yeah. And uh, they served group actions for the next 20 years until GLOs were brought in. And GLOs do no more than provide the court with a broad framework within which to exercise its inherent jurisdiction, which is what it had already been doing for the past 20 years. And the broad point I seek to make is that the, the relevance of the sophistication of the legal system we're dealing with is that, as you can see, there may be a debate about how well it will do it. And one could imagine a debate between different lawyers in this country about how effective the court is at managing and dealing with different matters. We've had huge criticisms in this country of our, G our group actions not actually giving access to justice, about the impact on access to justice of the abolition of legal aid and so on. All legitimate debates but one sees coming through Justice Rezek's evidence, and whatever debate there may be, one does see a legal system in a, exactly the same way as one would expect, dealing with these, the problems of how you deal with multiple claims. I would submit dealing with them effectively, but certainly using mechanisms that are just as well adjusted as ours to ensuring a fundamental outcome is efficiency, justice, and expedition. If this is genuinely an open question, and I know you'll take it as such, but just standing back and listening to your overarching submissions on delays and numbers, uh, how do you square that with um, some of the contents of the 19 witness statements? And I'm just looking at the uh, junior statement at 3455 bundle O, which is an example of the procedural history there in that claim. Um, my, my lady, my, my, my first point in relation to the 19 uh -huh. is that it's more, very interesting what is not there. There are no individual persons claiming about access to the Brazilian courts. There are some small sand mining businesses complaining about Renova. Mm -hmm. But in the 19 witness statements, you don't have a single statement, this is my 70,000 point, from an individual saying, I couldn't get legal aid, I couldn't find yeah, a lot. You've made that point, yes. yes. So what are they? Yeah. Um, they're statements from some of the 58, yeah. from some utilities, from mu some municipalities, all of whom are bringing fairly complex claims, and you see that from Vivan too because he's well, a... They're, they're, they are statements from those, but they're statements about a wider range of claimants. I mean, the mayor of Mariana talks about the effect in relation to claimants throughout the municipality, not just the municipality's own claims. Well, it's, it's difficult for me to deal with the hearsay evidence of that type. I mean, Mariana has its own, agree has its own agreement, it's had its own CPA, and there's... haven't been, as far as I know, 
well, it's difficult to say there haven't been complaints and criticisms because I'm sure, I'm sure that I'll be corrected. But I, I can't meet every potential individual criticism. Um, and in my respectful submission, it's not necessary for me to do so. Uh, and I, I, I don't wish to be too, too sweeping in, 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 in describing the, the, the 19, and I apologize if I was. But broadly speaking, what one sees is a small number of claims. I, I appreciate that there may be white some wider general criticisms. Um, but so far as those particular claims are concerned, uh, they're dealt with um, uh, in Vivan 2. And we'll, we'll deal with those. We'll give you the reference. The references, I, I'm told, I haven't got the precise reference because there are different references across his statement. So we need to put that in our document for you. And he deals with each of the cases. And he's dealt with them individually. and. Um, Essentially, it, it, there are certainly some cases, and some of these are examples, where they are progressing. That is one theme across them. But there are a great deal of procedural and different arguments going on in that particular case. But I'd be very surprised if one was not able to find some cases in this jurisdiction in different courts which have, over the years, taken time to resolve for different reasons. Some of the complaints are of a don't really go to the legal system. Um, the sand miners tend to say they're the Renovo what can they are they? Yes, yes, they tend to say, well, Renova sent along a so-called expert who did some dredging, but it all it was all very it seemed pretty perfunctory to yes. us. Yes, they didn't do a good job, and they told us everything was okay. Now, it's quite difficult to form a view about that, but it's not a view about the legal system and about delays of quite the kind. Some of the others I appreciate are, are different, but one has to look. There's a variety of different kinds of complaints made by different kinds of claimants in those the, the, statements. The, there are different complaints. The sand miners are complaining about Renova. It is, it is not part of my case that it is impossible to find individual claimants or associations who will not have genuine grievances about Renova, say, plainly. Genuine in the sense of legitimate, they, rather than, they, rather than they, genuinely felt. That they, they, they are genuinely felt. I can't say how legitimate they are, but I can't rule out the possibility that some individual may have, as in this example, uh, not received the perfect mediation that obviously, or the, the best form of mediation that is intended. That's, that's, Inevitably, that's, that's, what, that's essentially a theme throughout the 19 witness statements. Or, uh, yes. Far, far from not the perfect. But, I mean, it's but we're, we're looking at this. What scheme in history has ever been without complaint? What court system has ever been without complaint? That cannot lead to, to, to the inference that there is a, it is pointful to come to this jurisdiction. We, we, we've discussed whether it's pointful to come in order to set up another scheme and by submission that's not even argued for. So there's no scheme here, no prospect of a scheme. It's all about some form of individualized assessment. I've shown you the statistics, I've shown you the evidence, and it seems to me it, it's plain and obvious that the claimants cannot fairly say, cannot cannot say that it is that, that, that it is not plain and obvious that the judge was right that any delays will be far greater in, in England. Even if you could have individualized assessments in England, when you have to go through the liability trial, you then have to um, find some way of coming to England in order to have your claim individualized, individually assessed. It's, it's plain it's not credible. So, when we're looking at questions of relative timing, so how, how, long, thing, how long things may take, are, should we be looking at it from the English point of view, as though things were only going to start now? Or should one be looking at it from the English point of view, of where would we be uh, had there been no challenge? and the proceedings had got going in 
2019. Well, we're, we're looking at the, in my submission, one's looking at the position as it was before the judge, and it's the relevant, the, the relevant dates are from 2019. If the claimants had been able to start then, But I, it, I just think about this. Surely, this is a perfectly proper challenge, and therefore the question is: if the claimants are given permission to proceed, but what entitled, the relative differences uh, are. Sorry, but I'm mean, entitled to say, um, if, if if there hadn't been this challenge, then uh, we might be at or close to. to having determined the liability stage in these proceedings. Uh, I would I, say not. It is approaching three years after the commencement of the claim. I would say not. Because? This is a perfectly, the claimants have elected to come to, to these courts. This is a perfectly legitimate and proper challenge, mm -hmm. and an inevitable challenge. It's not an inevitable challenge, is it? Well, it's, well, it's, it's a you, challenge that succeeded. You mean, you mean, you mean at least it's a, it's a very large, a properly arguable challenge. Yes. Indeed, uh, it, it has succeeded at first instance, whether or not it's yes, in front of us. But, but if it fails, um, if you do not uphold the judgment, then it may have been it will have been self-inflicted delay. Why, why are you entitled to the benefit of it, so to speak? Well, there's a, on that scenario, we're talking about a year, two years, and in my submission, on the basis of the evidence, it's still clear and obvious, applying the comparative test, that it is not pointful proceeding to try and establish liability here. They still have to get over the liability hurdle. All we're dealing with here is the next stage of time for individualised assessment. So to some extent, and it's more, and the, the liability hurdle is obviously a, a critical factor in the tangible benefit. Realistically, and it's very difficult to do these exercises, but you started in relevant proceedings in May 2019. I mean, some time for you to do a pleading, I suppose there'd been no objection. We wouldn't have got to trial, nor the pandemic, any earlier than what? We would be still... We don't obviously, you haven't seen what your defence would be, so we'd have to guess, but we're we meeting a claim based both on control and on fault-based fault-based liability. It'll be a long trial. It's a long trial. You're looking at a number of years and potential appeals. Unless, unless one took the strict liability yeah. as, 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 as the liability issue, issue first, which is a, would be a case management course that was at least open. But even with strict liability, you're still, in my right submission, it's, it's common ground. You're looking at a... You've got, your control, you've got your control issues and so on. Yeah, yes. they're, they're much narrower. They, they, they may be narrower. Than, than the yeah. knowledge of risk and, and yes. so on. It's still a significant trial in my submission. Mm, but it might, certainly not one which would be unrealistic, could, could be dealt with at the first instance within, let's say, three years of commencing the claim, would it? Then, I'm so sorry, we're looking. Not unrealistic to think that that could be concluded within three years of the claim being commenced, which would be next month. Well, in my submission, it is unrealistic, mm. um, well, given the extent to which the control is said to be also referable to particular individuals. One also has to build in the possibility of appeals. It's certainly our position is a novel yes, point. Okay, well, let's forget mean, about appeals. I mean, which is, this is only a rough exercise, but broadly speaking, let's, with reluctance, if you don't mind accepting what my Lord suggested, mid-2022, for a decision, ignore an appeal, that would then be a process of case management of the individual assessments, which would, as you point out, are enormously variable. 
going from archdiocese and um, uh, large companies at one end down to individual washerwomen at, at, a, at another. Take some time to get that case management system in place. No idea how long. It's not going to be straightforward. It's in, in my submission, it's just not feasible. It's well, and even if it is, let's assume it's feasible. Claim well, I mean, I read the difficulty of it would mean a great deal of work devising a system that produces an efficient outcome. So you might. Me, that might well take another year you, before you started actually having hearings. You, you, the, so the claimants would have spent all of this time seeking to establish liability in circumstances where throughout this period that we're talking about, they could have gone to the small claims courts in Brazil. Yes, well, I see that. I've just got a long way to go on the timing. Well, it's just doing a, I know there are lots of other points, but just looking at timing, uh, there's a long way to go in Brazil as well. I mean, according as I understand it, to the figures you gave us, which I think come from your company accounts, it's about 19 billion reals that has so far been spent. And that's not, that, that's, that's the whole of what's been spent on remediation, not, not compensation, in relation to claims which are estimated to be 155 billion reals. Now, I know that, that that's a figure which may which is an estimate. It's as but it, but it, by it's, reference to Blue Water. But if it's right. even uh, vaguely uh, accurate, it means that as of um, the end of last December, uh, there's only been a fraction, a relatively small fraction, of what might be payable yet been paid out. So to say, well, you're still, if you've got to the liability stage now, you've still got quite a long way to go before anybody gets any money here. Um, isn't necessarily uh, well, my Lord. much much worse than than uh, would be the case in Brazil. Just just looking at those numbers. But those those numbers. I mean, the, the, you you'll have seen from part four of the one five five where the one five five, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, was plucked from. It's not a scientific figure. Hmm. But leaving that aside, the very large sums, the larger sums, are obviously in relation to the reparation works and the yeah. ongoing reparation. Works. So far as individual claims are concerned, that the individual claimants don't have to wait for a generic sentence in the 155. They can go, they could have gone to the small claims court at any point over the last three years, and they've elected not to do so. They could go to the small claims court tomorrow. So there's no, there's no delay for them. And so on my Lord's hypothesis, we well, have- They won't get any water damages claims because they're all stayed. They mean as that's, yes. That, that, that there would be a, 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 a stay in relation to the water damages claims for longer, but then we know that 100,000 of the claimants have already received water damages compensation from Renova, so they're going for a top-up. Yeah. Uh, or they can take advantage tomorrow of the novel system. So however one cuts the cake on the delay in my submission, one keeps coming back to the fact that, yes, one can envisage, and even if you take the start date earlier, and you take out of account the fundamental point that they've embarked on a course that in pursuant to which they have to establish liability. You can envisage a situation where they get to an English, to its position in English proceedings, where there are then directions being made for individual trials, assuming even that's possible. Then at the end of that, they get 70% or a bit more. So they've, they've gone through the liability burden. They've on any view in my submission Delayed. I was just on the timing point. I was, yes. just, I was just exploring that. And can, can I, whilst I've got you blown off course, just ask you something else about timing, which is um, what, what is the point of time at which we should be addressing the adequacy, that's the right word, of redress in Brazil? Um, because in the course of your submissions, you were keen to point out that, of course, there are problems, but things have got better, and there have been challenges, they've met them, and you've referred to quite a lot of evidence as to what's been going on since. But do we say, well, you needed to show, you need to show that the claims were abusive when commenced? So that's, look at it in May 2019. Do you need to show that the claims were abusive at the time the judge made his decision or the time that you made your application 
Or are you entitled to say, never mind what the position was up until now, you, the Court of Appeal, have got to be convinced that they're abusive, looking at all their address, knowing what we now know about what's been going on in Brazil since then? Well, my, my first position is that um, the, the judge was right and the claims were abusive at the date of his judgment. That's the relevant date. Um, but if the court considers that it's going to re-exercise the discretion and we are therefore relying on our respondent's notice, I would say the court can and should take into account the routes of redress available now. And if, if, one, if the judge took account, as he clearly did, and you're asking us to, of the developments after the claim was commenced, perhaps the most obvious is the normal justice system being introduced yes. just before the, 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 the judgment. Um, do you say, well, that's justifiable because uh, even if claims are, abusive, are not abusive when issued, they can become abusive in the light of subsequent developments? Yes, I do. And therefore, that's the point of time I do. which they fall to be judged. Right, thank you. Uh, it, it may be, uh, I'll have to ask Mr. Toledano whether what, quite the same principles apply to Article 34, but uh, I expect you will leave that in. While you're blown off course, can I raise a, a different point? Um, it seems to me orthodox, although there aren't many examples, um, to say that a court can properly stay, though not, I think, strike out, court proceedings pending resolution of a scheme designed to deal with claims of that kind, an industry-wide scheme, a non-judicial scheme. Um, and we referred briefly yesterday to um, PII, no doubt there are others. Um, but as a matter of authority, I'm not aware of any that say you can stay proceedings in court A by court procedure A because well, no, perhaps I, well, I'll finish my point, there may be an answer to it, court proceedings A, because you could have brought them by court proceedings B, which would be quicker and better. Now, of course, it's less likely ever to occur in one jurisdiction, because there, in, you might not call it abuse or stay, it would just be managed appropriately. And if you'd started in the small claims court, you could have been in the high court, or the high court, you could have started in the small claims court, it will be transferred or allocated. But I am slightly grappling, if we ignore the fact these other court proceedings are in Brazil, I'm slightly trying to work out whether abuse is the right tool to talk about a choice made by claimants to proceed in one set of pro perfectly proper court proceedings when it said you should have um, gone by other perfectly proper court proceedings which would have been easier for you. Is, 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 uh, well, that, 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 is, that is why I, um, to answer the proper tool point, um, we are in a, in a unique situation. The, the, the English court has never faced a situation that, of the sort we are grappling with. Um, none of, no, no other group action that I'm aware comes even close to it. Um, and that, that's why I, I started off when I touched on the legal principles of, of, of stressing uh, what has been a feature of abuse of process law and was then adapted and used by Lord Justice Stuart Smith and others in the Wyeth case, that one adopts a flexible approach and doesn't seek to put in a particular case. Yes, I, I think perhaps um, all I was asking, and without getting your submissions all over again, I didn't that rudely, was whether you can think of any parallel situation covered by authority. I suppose the answer is if you could, you would have um, produced it. Well, one, 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 sees, one sees in the PPI cases um, that, uh, it was not a Judge Waxman, that was a stay in that case. Yeah, but that's a point about a scheme. scheme. And one, see, one, 
What's You're talking puzzling me about this is traditionally one's always told it's up to you where you sue in courts, but there's a particular public policy about schemes which are set up to deal with a particular class of action. You can't strike out because there is such a scheme, but you can stay. But here we've got a choice just between two sorts of court proceedings. Well, it's Public a policy generally is you sue wherever you like. Well, it's a, it's a mixture. It's, it's a, a mixture of uh, Renova and small claims courts. So it's not just court proceedings. Um, and I, I would submit that that, that is why adopting the flexible approach, a stay on the grounds of abuse of process may, may be the just solution in those circumstances. Yes. Or it in fact is the just solution if, if your lordship has those concerns. And the court definitely has a broad discretion. It's a, there's, no, there's no doubting that. But yeah. Unfettered. The example might be you, 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 you could bring your claim in the commercial court or in, or in the chancery division. It could perfectly fall within each. You choose one. You don't get it stayed or struck out on the basis you do just well, as well to have brought it in the other. You elect. It's not, it's not, it's not an abuse to have chosen to bring it in that, in that court, even though it might just as well have been brought elsewhere. But certainly in this instance, the, the category of, of abuse that I rely on is that it is pointless and wasteful. And in the context of that, that, is, that gives you, as it were, the juridical banner. It's open to the court to exercise its unfettered discretion, which would involve staying the claims. Well, thank you. Uh, it, it's been, I've been puzzling about it, and um, I may have to puzzle about it some more. You want to get, allow yourself to, yeah, to I'm, I'm sail back on circumstances the where we're talking about a different different defendants, of course. Here, in, in our case. no, that's a fair point, and that's of course that's where, where you have your analogy with Wyeth. But yes, I'm not sure it's a complete. That's answer. the Wyeth principle, in a sense. Now. Could I just take soft, my lord? Would you give me yes. one moment? Well, I was dealing with the lack of any tangible benefit for the claimants, and I think I have uh, made my points as fully as I can in relation to that side of the. Yes, if you like the uh, the Jamil abuse test, we say it's pointless and waste, and, and therefore it is wasteful. But in addition, we point to the the burdens on the court, the lack of manageability, and all the other burdens uh, that were identified by the by the judge. And I need to go to the judgment, but as, as essentially, as you know, he identified the overlapping issues in the. 155 and any GLO over here, and I've taken you through the causation and damage issues and the huge duplication and waste that would be involved in that. Um, claimants take the point, well, we're not parties, we're not, we're not claimants in the 155, but of course they're beneficiaries of the 155 and can take advantage of it and indeed want to take advantage of it because they want to take advantage of improvements that are made in the 155. Uh, they want to take advantage of improvements in um, Renova. Uh, then you you have the the individual claims, and you you'll you have seen that one of the, the judges in my submission entirely uh, correct concerns was the extent to which there would be cross contamination of the individual claims, the constant ebb and flow. Uh, with different claimants dipping in and out at any one time, uh, members of the group uh, with, with, with access to Renova might settle their claims, and then the size of the group would be would be reduced. Other claimants would be bringing claims in different courts in Brazil. From a case management point of view, you you have an impossibly difficult situation. And my submission, the judge's concerns about that, if one got to the to the stage of individual claims all having been managed in tandem 
the claimants say, well, we can, we can, they at one point offered to undertake uh, for those claimants who brought claims to, it, to, to withdraw them or agree to withdraw them. Uh, that undertaking doesn't seem now to be given to the court, but they're still reserving the right, as the judge rightly found, it, to bring claims uh, in Brazil at any time. Uh, and that was a matter of real concern to the judge, paragraphs 101 to 103, where he said if they were suddenly to be told now no, you can't bring claims in Brazil, you can't take advantage of Renova. Uh, that would affect the viability of the action. And in my submission, as the judge rightly recorded in paragraph 91 of his judgment, and you've seen the way in which, as with any group action, uh, rather than taking instructions from one claimant, you have to have a, a group approach to ensuring claimants understand the terms, as it were, upon which they're signing on. And a term, a clear term, as the judge, um, as the judge recorded in paragraph 91, uh, was the answer to the, the, the clues in the name, the frequently asked question: Can we bring proceedings at the same time in Brazil? And the answer is yes, you can, but you'll have to give credit. And as the judge rightly points out in his judgment, and I submit is plainly correct, the idea that just giving credit is a is a simple matter when. Uh, you, you, it's, it's necessary to identify exactly what heads of claim were, what heads of, what heads of claim were available. My learned friend says, well, matters of Henderson and Bruce and collateral attack can all be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but in, in my submission at this stage, it's sufficient when taking into, a, a, taking into account the second limb of the Jamil test for the court to do exactly what the judge did which is to look at the practical implications of that and the realities and the serious burden on the court and the parties that that would inevitably produce. No, well, I don't underestimate those difficulties at all. Indeed, I'm very struck by them. But they're not, that particular one is not insoluble. Renova may be assumed to have records of what it has paid. And in cases where people are, receive money by claims brought in court, the uh, defendants in those proceedings will be um, uh, BHP subsidiaries ultimately. And with careful record keeping, I mean, that's not straightforward, I appreciate, but less, less difficult if claims are properly digitized and so forth, you can actually say, well, we paid you X reals. My Lord, we're, we're, we're now on the assumption that it's necessary to have individualized assessments of some sort, and where where the big question mark as to whether that would be feasible. What, what one is entitled to take into account at this stage, the realities of the, the, the process, the, the, the need to, to, to translate the documents. We, we may be talking about individual claims worth, in real terms, a few hundred pounds, um, even if it's a few thousand pounds. All of these hurdles and burdens add immeasurably to the difficulty uh, that would be encountered in each individual case. And that is the irony of what the claimants are saying. They say, we want each individual case to be assessed in this way. We, we're, we're not interested for the purposes of this argument in a scheme. And once you go down that route on an individual basis, you're really proposing a, a procedure or, uh, uh, which, in my submission, is, 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 is economically unviable in an individual case. Does, it, does, does someone who's had a payment from Renova have credit for it if, in, if they've got a local claim or other losses? They would do, yes. So that's, so that's, some, some sense, so that's, that's an exercise which may, may arise, not necessarily on the same scale. Well, it's, in any event. It, it, it arises before a local judge in a much, I would say, a much more, a much less inconvenient and much less difficult situation. Um, so yes, those sorts of issues could arise in the Brazilian courts before local judges, uh, and they dealt with them. But um, in my submission, the judge was right that in circumstances where none of this could be dealt with by way of video evidence, uh, it would be necessary for the claimants to come to, to, to England. These are all factors which one is entitled to take into account when one's considering the additional burden on the court. And uh, they're major factors in an individual case, so it's not just a group point, as it were, but given that this is a group action, the court is entitled to take into account 
um, the management and other difficulties, uh, burdens caused by thousands of claimants seeking individualised assessments in this way. So we respectfully submit that the judge was, was right in the way he um, analysed the, the burdens and benefits. And the, the, the court, <coughs> e even if the court thinks, well, it, there are ways in which it might be manageable, on, on any view of the matter, these are serious burdens and complications and difficulties, adding to uh, expense and court time on a major, major level. And if, if it were to be said, well, there is some speculative benefit, uh, which I don't accept, as you know, in these proceedings being brought in this country, one is entitled to take those into account um, in, 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 in applying the Jamil uh, test. Uh, at, at this point, if I could just deal briefly with the um, jurisdictional arguments that were made, the, the, the second ground of appeal says that there's a, an inappropriate elision of um, ju jurisdictional arguments with um, in, in, in this case. Um, but I, I, I got the, the following response really, and it's a short point, but BHP's case on abuse is not that PLC or Limited should be sued in Brazil or that Brazil is the appropriate forum for this dispute, say because of language difficulties or video link or so on. Our case, as you know, is that these actions are pointless and wasteful by virtue of what is already available to them in Brazil by suing other defendants, namely Samarco and Renova, and through schemes in Brazil, namely Renova and a novel system. Um, and that's not undermining Article 4 of the Brussels recast or foreign non convenience jurisprudence, because we're not saying Brazil is a more appropriate jurisdiction for this dispute against BHP, PLC, or Limited. Um, and in cases like Owusu, and where Article 4 has been discussed, um, the concern is that the English court can't apply different domestic rules concerning the allocation of jurisdiction. Um, for example, no, as in Uusu, forum non conveniens to allocate jurisdiction differently and to require a claimant to bring a particular claim form against the Article 4 defendant in a jurisdiction other than the place of its domicile. It's not saying anything about domestic procedural rules, which are but, not concerned yeah, with think, allocation of jurisdiction, but have the sorry. purpose of safeguarding the administration right, of justice. Let you finish, but, but isn't that just putting another label on the same point? The point the reason why it's pointless and wasteful is you can sue in Brazil or you can get the money from the state No, absolutely not, my lord, with respect. We're not a defendant in Brazil. We're not saying we should be the proper courses to sue us in Brazil. It's only because there, it's only because there, is, there are different defendants. That's the... It's because of what is available in Brazil. If there are different defendants. It's because of what is available in Brazil and because this court is applying the principles applicable to, for the purpose of safeguarding, as I was about to say, the administration of justice within this jurisdiction. And there's, there's nothing in principle, there's no reason why, and, and it would be very surprising, and there's no reason suggested why one has four non convenience principles. But they obviously exist alongside abuse of process principles, and essentially that's what Lord Briggs, I know he wasn't dealing with this precise point, but that's broadly what Lord Briggs was saying in Vedanta. Obviously, this court retains its right, uh, which we ask it to exercise, um, to strike out a case as, a, as abuse of process, having regard to the principles that have been devised in the cases that I have, uh, that, that, that we've identified. Lord, I, th I think I have dealt with the, the various benefits which the claimants identify in their skeleton. But um, what I'd like to do, if I may, is uh, just take, take stock, because I've been, as it were, off-piste for some of today, 
uh, before finally closing my submissions on, on, on abuse uh, and asked Mr. Toledano if he would just start um, Article 34, if that's convenient to the court. I'm just ending this convenient, that's convenient for you. But when you say take stock, do you mean you might just come back tomorrow morning with a few more points? I might have these? a few more points just when I've, I've, I've taken stock, yes. Well, I don't think we possibly encourage that, but we wouldn't stop you if you um, felt there was something which, after two and a half hours on your feet, you um, uh, had failed to deal with. So. Uh, you can proceed in that way, yes. So, Mr. Toledano to start, is that it? But I think he's been consulted about it. <laughs> I'm very happy to start, uh, my lord. The, the only thing is, I, I need a few minutes oh, I'm sorry. Well, the it's not indulgence to, to, to move forward and to, to get files set oh, up. I'm, I'm just concerned. Of course, about we, can, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can rise for two, two or three minutes, but is it not simply a question of moving to the front row and taking your stowaway with um, you? I, I need to, uh, possibly, I, I need to. I need a laptop. We'll room. rise for a minute or two. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>
Sorry, Mr. Toliano, we gave you longer than you probably needed, but as you can imagine, as soon as we got out, we started <laughs> talking about the case. So, um, thank you, my lord. Um, can I start by briefly um, and very briefly summarising the arguments that uh, I make in relation to Article 34, and then I'll move on to address the specific points that arise in broadly the same order as my learned friend. Uh, it's common ground that the 155 CPA is pending in the 12th Federal Court in Belo Horizonte. On the face of it, and subject to the points of criticism, which I will of course address in due course, the 155 is preeminently the type of action that Article 34 targets. It's a closely related action located in the natural forum for Brazilian law governed claims brought by Brazilian claimants arising from an environmental disaster in Brazil. Now, in the court below, and also in grounds eight and nine of their grounds of appeal, the claimants contended that the judge's approach to Article 34 1A was wrong, and that Article 34 1A was not satisfied. And it's fair to say that that was a major plank of their case. Now, and those grounds are no longer relied on, and instead the claimants now accept that 34 1A is satisfied. And that means that they accept that the actions are related in the sense that it is expedient to hear and determine them together to avoid the risk of irreconcilable judgments. So um, although when it comes to 341C, my learner friend seeks to minimise the extent of relatedness and the risk of irreconcilability, the court must keep in mind that 341A is conceded. Now, as the court has heard, the claimants continue to take two points in relation to 341B, and I'm going to deal with those shortly in a moment. The thrust of the claimants' challenge to the judge's conclusion on Article 34 uh, concerned the proper administration of justice under 1C and also the exercise of discretion. And in my learning frame submissions, he addressed 1C and the exercise of discretion together, and, and I uh, propose to do the same. Now, given the evaluative and indeed discretionary nature of the exercise that the judge was required to and did undertake, the threshold for the appeal is a high one, and in my respectful submission, the claimants failed to meet it. Uh, my learned friend said that the standard of review, so far as the threshold conditions is concerned, it is different to that in relation to the exercise of discretion because he said the threshold conditions are either satisfied or not with only one correct answer and um, I can see the force of that in relation to 341B but 341C requires an evaluative judgment to be made based on all the circumstances of the case in a way that all parties agree is closely bound up with the exercise of discretion. And it follows in my submission that the standard of review in the case of 341C cannot differ in substance from that which applies to the exercise of discretion. Now, <clears throat> as the court knows, the judge um, would have granted a stay without needing to decide whether the English action and the 155 could be consolidated. And the claimants refer to what the judge did as a wait and see stay, and, and we've adopted that terminology, as you know, from our skeleton argument. And our primary position on this appeal is to support the judge's conclusion on a wait and see stay. Uh, in the alternative, you'll have seen from our respondents' notice that we revive the case that we put before the judge that the English action reconstituted in the form of a new CPA can be heard and determined together with the 155 by the 12th Federal Court. And assuming that consolidation is practicable, which I will obviously have to address, it, it would, we submit, be in, in the interest of justice for that to take place. Uh, there would then obviously be a single court in the natural forum looking at all of the relevant issues. Um, so that's uh, all I wanted to say by way of introduction. Um, before I turn to 341B, can I uh, first make a few short points about the regulation itself? I know you've looked at it already, but just a few short points. And for that purpose, 
if you could turn up authorities bundle F, where you'll find the regulation, it's tab 52. And I start at page 1746, which is the uh, 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 relevant recitals. Uh, <clears throat> recitals 23 and 24 apply uh, specifically to articles 33 and 34 and are therefore the key recitals for uh, the court's purposes. Uh, my Lady Lady Justice Carr referred additionally to recital 15 which says that the rules of jurisdiction should be highly predictable and of course I accept that's relevant too but, but that is referring to all of the rules of jurisdiction in chapter <coughs> 2 of the regulation whereas recitals 23 and 24 are specifically directed and targeted at articles 33 and 34. Now these two uh, recitals refer to, to important features of the intended operation of Articles 33 and 34, and if I could just identify them. First of all, Recital 23 says they're intended to produce a flexible mechanism, and that's a key consideration uh, which the court has already alluded to in the context of the debate about the meaning of 34.1b. The second point is that as the court identified again during my learned friend's submissions, the second part of Recital 23 focuses on whether a judgment of the third state will be capable of recognition and enforcement in the member state. And there's no mention in Recital 23 of whether a judgment is expected with any particular degree of certainty or with any particular period of time. And that's only mentioned in Recital 24, which concerns 341C. And as you know, that's one of the reasons why we submit that whether a judgment is expected is only relevant in the context of 1C and not in, in the context of 1B, which is concerned only with the question of whether, in principle, a judgment of the third state will be capable of recognition and enforcement in the member state. Uh, the third point that I wanted to address concerns Recital 24. That tells you that when it comes to the proper administration of justice, all the circumstances of the case must be taken into account. Three factors are specifically mentioned connections between the facts and parties and the third state, the stage to which the proceedings in third state have progressed, and whether or not the court of the third state can be expected to give a judgment within a reasonable time. And as is clear from that recital, 341C is intended to be a very broad test. Now, just so that you're aware, that I, I hope you've picked this up already from the skeletons, but in the court below, the claimants contended that the court could not take into account what might be called uh, forum non convenience factors when considering Article 341C. And the judge agreed with us, and that's in the judgment at 205 and 206. The claimants were wrong about that. He concluded that all the circumstances of the case meant exactly that, and included factors that might otherwise be called or might be relied on in a forum non convenience context. Now, the claimants no longer pursue that argument on appeal. They make that clear in their skeleton. And that's uh, because they can't rely on that argument any longer because of a case, a decision of this court, in a case called Ness Global Services against Perform Content Services, recent decision of this court, which expressly approved Mr. Justice Turner's inclusive and broad approach on this point in the present case. And I won't go to it now, but the reference is um, Authorities Bundle D at tab 36 at paragraph 67. Uh, I think it was the judgment of Lord Justice Flo. Uh, could I then ask, invite your attention uh, to Article 34 itself? Well, uh, I think that might be a good point to break. Of course, I'm. <laughs> right. 10 o'clock start tomorrow. Oh, yes.